Well, thank you everybody for joining us for the IEP training. If you haven't already done so, please put in your name, your school and or your district, as well as your role. We just like to know who joins us. We like to see who we're chatting with and take a peek at this visual and just put in the chat box any words that jump out at you. You know, what, what sort of speaks to you? We're really interested in that as well. And in the chat box, I think believe that my fabulous team has dropped in. Yep, Carly, thank you. She's dropped in two links to the PowerPoint. One where you can take some notes and the other one that has no note space, but the links are live. So go right ahead and grab those. And I know Julie will keep letting people in as we move forward. All right. Thank you, Carly. So this is quite a long, this is quite a long presentation. We do have a, a break built in if you, if you folks um, need that, but please feel free to just manage yourself however you need. Get up and move around, do whatever you need to do. That's perfectly fine. Drop questions in the chat box as we go through, um, and we will be monitoring that. If for some reason your chat, your question gets missed, gets lost, feel free to let us know. If we are moving too quickly, if we breeze over something that you want clarification on, please feel free to stop us. This is your training, so we want it to work for you. So feel free to interrupt us at any time and just ask for what you need. So we are here to talk about the IEP, but the place that we're gonna look at it really, we're gonna talk, well, Jennifer, our, our law, our lover of law is going to dive into the Andrew F case. And it's a really important case because it really had a huge impact on the IEP, how we develop and think about the IEP, specifically present level and annual um, progress, as well as FAPE as a whole. So that's the lens that we're gonna have that our conversation today. So this is my team. Uh, my name is Colette Sullivan. I am the Federal Programs Coordinator, and I am so lucky to be surrounded by these amazing folk. I joined the department about five years ago. Before that, I was a special education teacher around the state for uh, about 30 years, and I worked primarily with students with autism. So, uh, Jennifer, could you jump on, please? Hello, I'm Jennifer Gleason. Um, I, too, was a special education teacher and an ed tech before that, and I joined the department about two and a half years ago. Thanks, Jennifer. Carly? I am Carly Thibodeau. Uh, I joined the department in this team about a year and a half ago, and before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. Fantastic. And Ashley? Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Satry, and I am the newest member of the team. I have been here for about six months. And before that, I was a special ed teacher uh, in Maine and Virginia for 14 years. I love how you said you've been here for six months instead of introducing yourself as a newbie. That's fantastic. That's exciting. I, I'm excited about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. Um, I am starting my seventh year with Maine Department of Education. And prior to that, I was admin support in a K-5 to elementary school for 16 years. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Appreciate sure. it. This is our contact information. If you need to get in touch with us, this is how you can do that. We work really hard to maintain a pretty tight turnaround for emails and phone calls. So um, if you've got a question, a concern, you want clarification around something, please feel free to reach out to any of us. And um, also, one of the things we'll talk more about is if you have um, an IEP that you're developing, a transition plan that you're working on, you've got a question about a specific goal, present level, any of those pieces, and you want to shoot those to us for feedback, we love that. We are having more and more people do that, and it's wonderful. We only would ask that if you do that, that you send it to us in an email, not on an IEP, because the federal government, the federal DOE requires us to ask for correction on any errors that are sent to us. So if it comes to us as a hypothetical or if it comes to us not attached to an IEP, not attached to a student, we are we love to give feedback because we want you to be successful. We want your IEPs to be compliant. 
We want to be part of your team as opposed to, um, you know, the gotcha committee. That's not how we view ourselves at all. So please feel free to use us for that, for that purpose. So this is our agenda. We did introductions. If you have just jumped in, please add your name, your school, and your role to the chat box. We really like to keep track of that. As I mentioned, Jennifer is going to talk quite a bit about the Andrew F case and why it's important for us to even note it. We are going to walk through all of the components of the IEP very specifically. We have some other considerations that we just like to include, you know, other links to certain trainings and whatnot if you need more information. We have, um, we're gonna talk about our frequently asked questions and then we have quite a few resources that we just like to share as well. So we'd like you, as I mentioned, this is a bit of a larger group. So this is exciting for us, for our team. We like back and forth, we really do. So we'd like you to start by just putting in chat something that you hope to get some clarification around. You know, do you have a question about a specific component to the IEP? Are you really struggling maybe with present level? Um, you know, or just what are some pieces in the IEP in the development of your IEPs that you would like to get some clarification on? Something you're hoping that this training will help you with. If you could just take a second and put that in chat, we'd really appreciate that. Section 4C, thank you. Okay, for the purposes of time, while you guys are thinking of that present levels, thank you. Um, let, me just, let me just tell you why we're asking you to do this. Um, many of you have probably joined us for the IEP training before. Welcome back, we're happy to have you. We are really trying to update our, our PD opportunities all the time. We really want them to reflect what the field needs. We really want them to reflect what you're looking for. And we really wanna make sure that we're meeting your needs. So that's one reason we're really asking for that. At the same time, we're really trying to honor what we are being asked to do by the federal DOE. And what does our data tell us we need to look at? It's interesting that somebody put present level in because present level is something, oh, present level again, that's fantastic. Present level is something that the state, we have noticed statewide, we really need to do a better job articulating how to develop clear present levels for, for the field. So that is something that we are right on, right on track with, um, but we are always interested in feedback from the field. So that information that you're dropping into the chat box is really helpful. So with that in mind, we also want to sort of set you up for what we typically have been seeing when we're on site and we're doing IEP reviews so that you sort of have that um, just that sense of where we're going and why we focused on what we focused on. So during some of our previous on site visits, more than 50 percent of the IEPs we reviewed did not meet compliance because there were gaps identified, for example, but there were no, no corresponding goals. You're gonna hear us talk a lot about alignment and this is one of the places where that really is important. So if you identify a gap, there needs to be a goal, okay? So that's one thing we really wanna look at. How statements are missing. As you know, the IEP really, it, it incorporates that how statement with the skill deficits and we're not seeing that consistently. Goals were not measurable because they included references to specific curriculum standards. This is something that we're gonna talk a lot about. So what this means simply is we're not, it, it's not a compliant goal if you're referencing a specific level in a curriculum. We're gonna tell you how to avoid that. Goals were not measurable because they included multiple skills and therefore progress monitoring couldn't happen. So, you know, if you have a goal that includes comprehension and fluency and decoding, that's multiple skills and you would not be able to progress monitor on that. Present levels, several of you identified this as an issue. We've identified it as something we need to do a better job talking to you about as well. But what we have seen is that present level statements often say child struggles with or child sometimes, and there's no clear baseline data. We wanna try to do a better job helping you understand what a clear present level looks like. Goals did not align with the service. We see this a lot with consultation. So if you have a consultation goal, 
we need to see consultation identified in section seven of the IEP as a service as well. Uh, services did not align with the goal. So that would be the exact opposite. Something that's identified in section seven does not align back to a goal. So again, we're gonna talk about alignment a lot. And then section nine F specific to transition planning we continue to see child will statements in section 9F. And this is transition services and there should not be a reference to the child in section 9F because it is not the onus of the child. It is not up to them to develop these services. It's up to the adults in the school and the community. So we just like to set you up. These are the types of things that we have seen pretty consistently and they seem to really align with what you all identified in the chat. Uh, this is a document that we developed uh, two-ish years ago. It is called, we call it the IEP quick reference document, although there's nothing quick about it. It's 14 pages long. Um, but we wanted to make this available to the field because it has everything you need in one document. I went out to dinner with a friend of mine who I used to teach with, and I've known her forever. Um, and she said to me, I just found your IEP quick reference document. I'm like, well, what do you mean you just found it? She said, I just found it and it is phenomenal. It is so clear. And one of the things that she identified was that it helped her understand that she was writing way too much in her IEP. So it, 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 for her, it helped save her time. This document highlights, if you look at the far left-hand column, it highlights the codes. These are just internal codes that we use if you are in cohort. So you can actually just disregard those, but if you see them, we wanted you to know where they came from. The next column is the location in the IEP where we would look for those specific findings. So RAE1, we would look in section 4A of the IEP. Then it has the MUSER citation. So it would tell you exactly where in MUSER where is the regulatory language that tells us what we have to look for? Because we don't just pull this out of thin air. We have to follow the regulatory expectations. So that column tells you where that is. But I think the biggest piece for those of you in the field that would be the most helpful, my hope, would be that last column. Because that outlines the very specific criteria that we look for and that would make that area compliant. So RAE1 is about results of initial or most recent evals for the child. And it tells you exactly what we would need to see. We would wanna see evaluations that support that eligibility discussion. We wanna see the evaluation name and we want all evaluations to be dated. That's it, that's all we look for. If your director asks you to include more information, then absolutely we would ask you to follow what your director asks you to do. But in terms of compliance and what we are tasked to look at, that's all we look at. So our hope, and there's a link here to this document, we update it every year. Our hope would be that this document will help you around those areas that are a little more challenging. Has anybody used the IEP quick reference document? Found it useful, found it overwhelming, found it not useful? I'd be curious to know if anybody has any thoughts around it. All right, what is the purpose of an IEP? So the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act says that the purpose of an IEP is to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them FAPE, that free appropriate public education that emphasizes special education and related services de designed to meet their unique needs and prepare them for further education, employment, independent living, and to promote movement back to the general education. So you can see all of those pieces right up to that post-secondary planning are included in this. This is section one of the IEP. You've all seen it, right? So you can see that this has the date that the IEP gets sent to the parent. You would include your SAU, all of the identifying child information, the annual dates of the meeting, the duration, all of this information would be included here. Regulatory expectations are that the IEP gets sent to the parents within 21 school days of the IEP meeting where the IEP was developed. So when you're looking at your dates, when we're reviewing IEPs, we would look at that. 
that 364 day timeline is very important. And it's important to remember that the date of the annual cannot exceed 364 days from when you last held your, your last annual. So in this example, you can see that they had an annual on 1-6-2022, which means that the next annual must happen on or before 1-5-2023. That is your 364 day timeline. That's one 364 day timeline you have to keep in mind. The other one would be the duration. Now the duration can be out. Our recommendation is that you start it out approximately 10 days, which gives you plenty of time to write the written notice, get that to the parent, give them time to review it. But once you determine when that IEP starts, it would still be 364 days. That duration could still only run 364 days. So again, in this example, you can see that the duration, the IEP started 116, 2022, but it can only run until 115, 2023. Okay. And this is why. So you've got your annual, uh, your annual meeting date here, as is in the example. So you, you need to hold it 364 days. So 16, it can only go till 1523. So give yourself three-ish days for mail so that the parents can have that written notice in their hand. So that takes us out to about 1922. And then that's seven days. So it gives you that time for that informed consent for the parent. It lets them read the written notice and think about that. And then the IEP would start on 116. And again, we're back to that second 364 day timeline. So the duration can only run that amount of time as well. So the IEP must end on 115 2020. So we're right back to that example that we shared. So I'm just pausing because there is a question in the chat box. I don't know if you wanted to address it while we're talking about the dates. It's asking 2024 is a leap year. Do we need to take that into account for? <laughs> In, for date of next meeting and duration? I had no idea 2024 was a leap year. I had no idea. Um, do we need to take that into account? Well, I mean, yes, I would. Um, but I, I, I think that my knee-jerk reaction would be I wouldn't give myself that extra day because you're going to lose it on the other end, if that makes sense. Does my team have a different thought? I, I'm pretty sure, let me look in Muser if it says a year or it says 364 days. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So parents can waive their right to seven day notice and allow you to choose to implement the IEP sooner than seven days. There is a seven day waiver form, it is optional. However, it is not optional for you to document this information in the written notice. So if the child's, child's parents waive their right to the seven day notice, you would need to document that. And you would need to document that including the language, the child's parents. It is not enough to say that the team agreed to start. You would really need to make sure that the parent and that wording specific to them is included in the written notice. When can a parent or guardian not waive their seven day notice? Anybody have a thought on that? You wanna drop that in chat? Any thoughts? When not at a meeting and at initial, Thank you, Carolyn. So, Carolyn, that was the guidance that we had given previously. You're absolutely right at when not at a meeting. Thank you, Renee. It's actually if they do not attend the meeting, they cannot waive their seven day notice if they are not at a meeting. We um, were um, given corrected guidance around this. So that's why we re we added this back into the PowerPoint because parents can, for an initial, waive their seven day notice, their seven day informed consent. 
as long as it's documented in the written notice that the parents did that, but they cannot do that if they are not at the meeting. So section two is, is about child with a disability is an individual who has reached three years of age, has neither graduated from a secondary school program with a regular high school diploma, nor reached 22 years of age. They've been observed in the learning environment, the classroom setting, they've been evaluated according to the rules, determined to have a disability which requires special ed, and they must have and they shall have one or more of the disabilities listed in MUSER. As you know, LD 98 chapter 450 codified the change in that ending age for special ed eligibility as of October 25th, 2023. So we are officially honoring that up to 22. We do not go through the disability categories in this training, we used to, but instead what we have, the, these section two outlines them. But if you go to MUSER, it will tell you exactly what all of the disability categories, it will define them and it will explain for you the procedures for de determination. We just because of time, we aren't able to really dig into that in this training. However, related to that, eligibility and related forms, we do have a, an office hour that is attached to this link for referral and something specific to the form. So if you have questions about any of that, this will take you to our, um, our office hour that will go over this in more detail. It's probably a half hour, 45 minutes, and you will get a contact hour for it. One more visual, then I actually have to jet off to a one o'clock meeting. But this is, this. I said that we're gonna talk a lot about alignment. This is that visual representation of that alignment piece. So when you are developing your IEP, when you're putting your IEP together, you want to think about all of these components. And we are going to walk through each one of these components as part of this training today. But starting with those current evaluation and or the progress results, right? So how does that drive the academic, functional, and developmental strengths? How does that drive those specific skill gaps, those, those measurable, distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps in academic and functional and developmental for those of you who work in, in CDS, which ties directly to present level, which ties directly to the goal, services, LRE comes into all of this. And then of course, all of this repeats every time you redo the IEP. When we review IEPs, we look for this alignment very specifically. So again, I mentioned back at the beginning, you know, for example, if there's a goal, there needs to be a present level, there needs to be a service attached to it. It should be aligned backwards to a specific skill deficit that falls under the umbrella of the strengths, the evaluation. So everything really needs to touch the other piece to make a, a cohesive IEP. Okay, I'm going to turn you over to the rest of my team before I, like I said, I have a one o'clock I've got to jump into, but thank you so much for joining us and um, have fun. Thank you, team. Thanks, Colette. All right, I'm gonna take you guys through section three. So section three of the IEP is the considerations. And so you're just gonna to wanna to think of this as the table of contents for your IEP. Um, and as you're going through and checking yes and no, um, what's important to remember is that any section of the document or any section of it that is documented as a yes would be expected to have corresponding information in the IEP itself. So the most common issue I think we see on the considerations is if your student has academic goals, then make sure that uh, box H is checked as yes. If they have functional and developmental goals, make sure that box I is checked yes. Sometimes I think um, that gets missed. So this is where that alignment piece really starts to come into play. Um, and so just making sure that anything that's marked yes has those um, corresponding information and that it's being discussed in the IEP meeting as to why it's a yes or uh, no. So section three is your table of contents and section four, um, this is the hot, hot uh, topic in the chat, which makes sense to me um, because before um, joining the department, this is probably the section of the IEP that I understood the least. And after joining the team, I, I think 
gosh, I really didn't know what I was doing or why I was doing it, at least in section four. So um, please take all the time you need for this section and put any questions you might have in the chat or slow me down because this is um, a really important section. And I would strongly encourage you guys to check out that IEP quick reference document. It's linked at the beginning, I think, and the end. Um, but that's really the first document that helped me understand what is being looked at in this section. So it's, it's um, you know, like Colette said, 14 pages, but it's definitely worth printing and using or having on your desktop because it really gives a clear picture of what each of these boxes is looking for. Um, so with that, starting with 4A, that's the results of all evaluations. So um, you're going to put your academic evaluations that were used for eligibility, functional evaluations that are used for eligibility or continuing eligibility, any relevant state or district assessments, any transition assessments, and any other relevant assessments such as an FBA or related transition uh, related service evaluations or transition stuff that you want to put in there. Um, and most importantly, just remember to have the name of the evaluation and the date that the evaluation was given, date or date, um, and any scores that highlight the strengths or needs in the student profile, as well as maintaining any scores that support eligibility. So for a student who has um, been identified as a, with a specific learning disability, we're gonna look for academic testing there, or autism, we're gonna look for autism rating scales there. I'm just going to pop up the chat really quick. Oh, that's Jennifer. Okay. Um, so that's section 4A. Section 4B, that's the academic and functional and developmental strength of the student. Um, this part of the IEP, I always love this because you can be a little bit more fluffy with your language. Um, you don't need as much data as you do in the other sections of the IEP. So you can really kind of gloat about what your student's doing well here. Um, the example we use for Leora is that Leora loves to read and has strong decoding and comprehension skills. She has strong writing skills and enjoys sharing her stories with peers. And Leora works hard and is very focused on all tasks presented to her. So in section 4B, make sure this isn't blank. Make sure you're putting um, what the student is doing well um, this could be based on evaluations or observations um, and include any strengths or relative strengths. Um, just make sure not to do a restatement of what the average standard scores are and give a little picture of what the strength looks like in the classroom. So that's section 4B. And now as we're getting into 4C, 4C is divided or 4C is your academic gaps. So when you're looking at the academic, you're gonna consider reading, writing, listening, speaking, and mathematical problem solving. And in 4C, you're gonna, it's a two part box. So that part's the very important that you're gonna need two things here. You're gonna want the distinctly measurable and persistent gap in academic performance and the how statement. So the first part being identification of the distinctly measurable and persistent gap in academics. And then the second, how does that gap affect the child's involvement and progress in the general ed curriculum? So just make sure you have two parts there. Um, and for the gap, when you're looking at those areas, we don't wanna see those broad academic areas. So on the left are the broad academic areas. But what you really need to do is drill down into those specific skill deficits. So um, as an example, in reading, instead of saying that the student has a gap in reading or struggles in reading, you're going to want to say that they have a difficulty with comprehension or fluency or what the specific skill is that you're teaching in order to help them with that deficit in reading. Now here's for that second part. So the second part being the how statement. Here are some examples of what that how statement could look like. Um, sticking with that same reading example. So we have a student who has a fluency reading deficit. Jimmy's reading fluency deficit impacts his ability to access grade level reading material. 
Um, and another example is we'll go down to the bottom for math. So Tom has a deficit in addition and subtraction, and this impacts his ability to participate in appropriate, in grade level of appropriate math activities. It goes into depth in the procedural manual on page 22. Um, so you can check that out. That's another great reference that I didn't have as much access to as I probably should have just on my own, but um, they're on, linked on the website. And once you read it, or if you haven't, you'll be like, oh, this explains what I need to put here. Um, okay, and then moving on to functional. Functional areas that you would consider would be cognitive, communicative, motor, adaptive, social, emotional, and sensory. And it's the same exact thing. So in section 4D, you're gonna have those two parts. You're gonna have your distinctly measurable and persistent gap in the functional performance and the how statement, which is how that uh, gap affects the child's involvement in the gen ed curriculum. And here are some of those specific areas that we would look at um, for an example for um, a communicative issue. Um, instead of saying that they struggle in communication, you would say that they struggle with, art or that they have a gap in articulation, following directions, answering WH questions, turn-taking, grammar, or similar. And obviously these are not all of the um, areas that are skill deficits. Those are just some suggestions. Um, I know there was a question in the chat about that. Um, and I was hoping maybe I could lean on Jennifer a little bit because Jennifer worked with um, some of those kids who had those um, life skills type of deficits um, like around cooking and I think it was laundry. Mm -hmm. um, so I get a lot of that. That was like my whole program was that kind of stuff. Um, on how to write persistent gaps in functional communication. A T for functional life goes. So yeah, that was all of my gaps and goals, but you're just going to kind of pull out specific skills that you're working on. Um, I know when I was teaching, I went through the file review process and I had a goal around doing laundry and then I had objectives, you know, one to put them in the washer, one to move them to the dryer and one to take them out and fold them. But then I was told those are three different skills. So it should have been three different goals. So I learned that. Um, Devin, do you have specifics that you're having trouble with? Yes, I'll type them in the uh, chat box. Okay. <laughs> um, and I didn't mean to put anybody on the spot. I just want to make sure that we're covering any of those specific questions. So we can keep going. And if you um, have more questions about that, please feel free to type them in the chat box. And there was a little check your understanding quiz in a minute. So that might fill in some more gaps too. So um, again, just remember in that 4D, same thing, um, having both parts with your distinctly measurable gap and your how statement. Uh, and again, the procedural manual on page 22 and 23 goes into a little bit more detail about that. And the same thing for section 4E, which is those developmental needs, um, same exact situation, just making sure that you're having the, you're identifying the distinctly measurable and persistent gaps in developmental performance, as well as the how statement of how that impacts their um, involvement in the gen ed curriculum. And um, the question is always whether it's a functional or a developmental goal. Um, we would say that this is an IEP team decision, of course, um, guidance being that if it's a functional area, it might be a lifelong skill deficit that the IEP teams feels that the child will not outgrow. And if it's developmental, it's more of a lagging skill deficit that the IEP team feels that the child will outgrow. Um, and so again, that's just an IEP team decision for our lens of compliance. We are not digging into whether it is functional or developmental as long as that alignment piece is there and that it's if it's listed in 
Um, for E, we would expect to see a developmental goal. And if it's in 4D, we would expect to see a functional goal. And um, just some takeaways from section four, um, just remember those specific areas. So just be very specific about teaching. What is that skill gap you are teaching? And what is that skill gap that they have? Um, avoiding those broad areas, any evaluation results and any standard scores. Um, here's an example of what this could look like. So for section 4C, the academics, um, we have a student who has an identified gap in fluent letter identification. And the how statement for that is that the skill gaps in this area impact Eli's ability to participate in literacy activities with same age peers. And in the functional section 4D, there is a distinctly measurable and persistent gap for reading and following a schedule. And the how statement being that this deficit impacts his ability to attend school and participate in all daily activities across his day. And just remembering both components, and I don't think I mentioned it, but you don't have to have one-to-one -one correspondence here for skill gaps to how statements. As long as your how statement is encompassing all of those skill deficits, one is fine, or you can write individual how statements depending on how you how it works for you. All right, and now to do a little check of our understanding. All right, so we're gonna look at section 4A first. And for this example, if you guys just wanna write your ideas in the chat, but um, we have the section 4A, the evaluations administered, we've got the WJ4 with the basic reading skills, uh, score 78, reading comprehension 79, reading fluency 73. Um, why would this not be compliant? That's right, no date listed, um, no uh, evaluator name, which I don't, we don't have to have an evaluator name necessarily. Is that right, Jennifer and Carly? But we just need the name of the evaluation. Yes, correct. correct. Okay. If the if the director wants you to put the evaluator or you know go above and beyond, but for compliance for what we're looking for, that's correct. Right. Yep. So no dates and no scores to support the strengths as well. So all right, instead there's that um, the name of the test written out. So we know what that is, dates that it was administered, um, and then you've got your skill gap and all your skill areas are listed, including. Um, areas of uh, need and skill. All right, we'll do another one for section 4B. So what is wrong with this section 4B? Does NA have to have a strength, absolutely yes. No strengths are documented, don't leave this section blank or put NA, every student has a strength, have to have a strength, yes. All right, and there's our example again of what that should look like, just making sure you've got that strength, some strengths of the student listed, what how they work, what they're doing, they're very focused, et cetera. So always include a strength. One more, here we go. Okay, so we've got section 4C. So in this section 4C, which um, is the academic performance, we've got reading and math listed. So why would that not be compliant? Yes, there you go. Very nice. Yep, it needs to be specific. And there's no how statement. Very good. Nice job. Those are those broad areas you want to avoid. No specific skill deficits. No how statement. All right, here's an example of what that would look like. So here's an example of having just one how statement for those two gaps. So you've got your persistent gaps in spelling and addition subtraction, and your how statement of skill gaps in these areas impacts Susie's ability to participate in academic activities with same age peers. Okay, another one, and this is for 4D. 
So in section 4D, we have Julia has executive functioning deficits and cannot maintain attention to task. Why would this not be compliant for 4D? There you go. Yep, health statement. Okay, and yes, so no health statement, um, no specific skill deficit. So that executive functioning, you're gonna really wanna drill down into what specifically the issue is and what you're working on. So is it, you know, reading a schedule? Is it organizing material? What is the specific skill gap that you're looking at there? And no house statement. You have to make sure you've got your house statement. So this student struggled with self-initiation. So that is the specific skill gap. Um, and that this impacts her ability to maintain attention and complete assigned tasks. All right, and I believe I'm turning it over to Jennifer. My turn. Is... Thanks, Ashley. Um, these are links to shorter trainings that go a little deeper on alignment and skill gaps and how statements. If you're interested, you can watch those and you get a contact hour for them. So nothing more fun than that. Um. Any more? Let me see. Print this. At, oh, Carly, you're so good. Um, Carly just put the PDF in there again. You can print those. Um, and one of them has those three with the lines for notes. All right. Any more questions for Ashley before we move on to the fun stuff? All right, I'm gonna keep moving then. All right, um, this is just, you need to, you know, um, describe how you are going to progress monitor and you need to send out progress reports at least as often as report cards go out for Gen Ed. All right, we're gonna take a little detour and we're gonna talk a little bit about Andrew F and a little bit about data my two favorite things, law and data. Um, so hopefully you know a little bit about the Andrew F case. Um, the final decision came out at the end of 2017. Um, so Andrew F, I always say was, but he's he is a um, student with autism. Um, and he was going to a public elementary school and he wasn't making progress. His IEP looked the same year after year. Um, he was working on the same skills every year. There wasn't any progress happening. So when he was going into fifth grade, his parents rejected the IEP and enrolled him in a private school that specialized in working with students with autism. And he started making progress in this school. So the parents filed due process to get reimbursed for that tuition. So at that time, the standard was the Rowley case. And Rowley, <coughs> excuse me, Rowley um, said that any progress is progress. Doesn't matter how small, merely more than de minimis is the legal term. Um, so, because of that, the hearing officer found in favor of the school because any progress is progress. And the parents appealed to district court who agreed with the hearing officer. They um, appealed again to the circuit court who agreed again, merely more than de minimis is fine. And they appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, wait a minute, this is not okay. Um, they said that every child has the right to work on um, goals that are appropriately ambitious, right? That And the IEP must be reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress in light of their circumstances. 
So what does this mean to us? It means you need to feel progress year over year, right? Merely more than de minimis isn't enough anymore. So what that means is when you are writing your IEPs, you need to think about how, what can this student achieve in one year? So I was functional life skills. My kids were working on skills for well over a year. Um, so maybe we were working on, I don't know what, something. And they were at 10% independence with this thing. Maybe the first year, I'm going to say, okay, their baseline is 10%. By the end of the IEP, we're going to get to 25% independence, right? We're not just going to put 80% on everything because we know this, this skill is going to take more than a year. So we're going to go up to 25%. The next year we get up to 25, we're going to go to 50% independence, that kind of thing. Really, you need to write your goals in such a way that they can be achieved in one year. If they're not and you're repeating it, that's where you're going to get into trouble um, under Andrew F. Um, if you want more information about this, this is a, um, a Q&A that the U.S. Department of Education put out. It is super easy to read. It's like seven pages long and gives you all the information about the case. So, you know, some light bedtime reading. Go for it. All right, data. See, another little tangent here, but it's all connected. We'll connect it all at the end. Um, use your data. We know that everybody is taking data all day, every day. Um, look at it. If you're just taking data and putting it aside until progress monitoring time and then trying to get it all together when you're doing your progress reports, you're not using it, right? It should be driving your programming. So if you are uh, really analyzing your data on a regular basis, it's going to show you that your student is not making progress. And if your student is not making progress, maybe you're not teaching it in a way that they can understand it. Maybe you need to change things up a little bit. And we're actually dealing with this on our team right now. We're really thinking about this in terms of our training for you guys. Um, so your data will tell you student isn't making progress or something wonky is happening. So you need to do a little detective work and maybe figure out, oh, I need to change how I'm teaching this. And maybe they'll get it then. You may have to change more than once. Um, this slide always messes me up, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's in the wrong place. Um, so you wanna make sure that your progress, you wanna make sure that your child is receiving all of their services, right? You want to make sure that um, the IEP team, right, everybody working on the goals is changing things as they need to. The student is getting their um, accommodations and they're making um, pro adequate progress on their goals. So think about Ben Drew F. We don't know what happened in his public school classroom, but I would hazard a guess that if the team was taking data and analyzing it often and using that analysis to drive their programming, maybe he wouldn't have stayed stagnant for so long and they wouldn't have gotten in the trouble that they got in. So use your data and think about the student when you are writing goals. All right, with that, let's get back to the IEP. Um, present level. So present level is your baseline data for that specific skill gap, right? For every gap, we're going to have a goal. And the present level is your baseline data for that particular gap. So we want to make sure that it's data, really specific data. Um, don't use subjective language like sometimes struggles with often. Um, 
approximately, don't use approximately about, don't use um, ranges, 50 to 75% less than, we see less than a lot. Just be really confident in your data and use a really clear data point. If you, um, if you don't have a lot of experience with the student, if the student is pretty new to you and you're writing their IEP, um, maybe you just do a quick probe to get your baseline data. That's your data. That's point in time. That's your baseline data. It's okay to do that. Um, all right, so what kind of data can you use? You can use skill-specific measurements or assessments. Make sure you're pulling the specific skill out. Um, qualitative data, checklist, daily log, running, re running record, work samples, rubrics. If you use a rubric, please attach it to the IEP. And we are having conversations about rubrics right now to make sure it's um, you might want to pull a specific skill out of the rubric because some of them have multiple skills. Some of them are kind of subjective. So think about your rubrics and make sure it fits with um, that kind of stuff that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, please do not use eligibility data, um, state or local assessments, grades, report cards, or specific curriculum for your present level or goal measurement. All right, present level is a must fill. So if the student has functional gaps, but no academic gaps, then you need to put a statement in that first academic present level that says they're on par with peers or they have no academic gaps, something along that line. Um, in that first present level because it cannot be blank. And the procedural manual talks all about present level on page 24. And in a couple of weeks, we're doing an office hours on present level. So come and hang out with us. We're gonna talk about data that day too. Um, don't forget your alignment, right? Every gap gets a present level, gets a goal. So do that. Um, so here is a good present level. Molly can decode CBC words with 45% accuracy. And the goal is we want her to decode CBC words with 85% accuracy. So you can see it's the same data point, right? Your baseline data for that goal. And we can assume that there is a gap that, about decoding. All right, any present level questions? Kind of went through that fast, I feel like. Did we have some at the beginning? Sorry, I'm running up to the beginning of the comments where so I thought there were some present levels. Oh yeah, some people did put present level in there. Okay, do you want to dig deeper into present level? Y'all good? I right. think there are more present level because I think this is just academic and then we'll talk oh, about functional. Functions. So it is the IEP training is set up a little bit different than what we're used to. So, yeah. All right. And as we talk about goals, too, we're going to get into data a little bit more. So it might help with the present levels. All right. So you're all familiar with the um, layout of the goals. And we're talking about academic. Um, standards, your um, goals need to be tied to standards. Um, remember the goal is child specific, right? It's based on their skill gaps. Um, so you're not gonna go to the standards and pull one and make that the goal. Um, often they entail more than one skill and you want it to, you want your goals to be child specific. So you're gonna, all right, this child has a gap in this. We're going to make a goal. What standard does that align to? Um, assume comp competence. You're going to begin with the grade the child is in. And if that's way too high and you can't find a standard that matches, you can go down from there. Um, but starting out, assume competence. 
Um, this is a um, just an example. If you're using main learning results and want to know how to um, cite that, it, you don't have to do it this way. We just got a lot of people asking how do you cite them because it's not as easy as it is with Common Core. So this is just an example that you can feel free to use. All right, so just like present level, we're using the same data point, so it's going to have the same rules, right? You can measure your goals using skill-specific measurements and assessments, qualitative data, checklist, daily log, running record, work samples, or rubrics. Again, attach the rubric to the IEP. And again, you're not going to use that eligibility data, state and local assessments, grades, report cards, or specific curriculums. So let's talk about specific curriculums. Um, so this is our pretend reading curriculum. And here we have a present level and goal. Leo is currently at level A in the pretend reading curriculum, and we want Leo to move to level B in the pretend reading curriculum. So a couple things here. Um, does the whole IEP team know what level A and level B mean? in the pretend reading curriculum. If the student were to change school districts and the, that the, uh, the, the new district didn't use pretend reading curriculum, would they know what that meant? Probably not. So we're gonna, this is what it means, right? Level A, 19 basic consonant sounds, high frequency sight words, one to 25, and segmenting simple CBC words. And level B is vowel sounds, the next, 15 sight words and CCBC words. All right, so that's A to B. So we want Leo to get from A to B. So what if Leo gets to two of these things, but not the other one? How how are you measuring that? Did he did he meet meet the goal or not? Um, each goal is one skill, right? And here we have three skills. So it would have to be three goals if you were working on all three of these things, right? Um, if they have deficits in vowel sounds and sight words, that's what you would make the goals in. So your goals are skill specific, right? Not reading level specific. So here we have a goal for segmenting CVC words and we have a goal for basic consonant sounds. Right, he can identify seven right now and we want him to identify 19. So each goal is one skill. All right, and remember what your present level is. It's baseline data. You don't even have to say the words present level anymore, just say baseline data. Then life will be good. All right, functional present level is really just the same as academic, right? Be really confident in your data. Um, don't use those um, subjective words, struggles with sometimes, often, um, approximately about less than ranges. Um, be confident in your data and you're using the same data point for your baseline data, your goal, and your progress monitoring. And just like academic, functional present level is a must fill. So if the student has academic gaps, but no functional gaps, you need to put that statement in that very first functional present level that um, they have no functional gaps or, you know, they're on par with peers, whatever, however you want to word that um, so that there's not a blank present level. And procedural manual talks about functional present level on page 26. Do you just want to describe 0% or if they haven't oh, started? Thank you. Thank you. Zero is valid. Um, zero is a valid baseline. Or if you say something like Leo is unable to request help independently, we will read that as zero. That's okay. Good one, Carly. All right, functional goals, 
same rules as academic goals, except you don't have to align them to standards. You don't need a citation for functional goals. All right. Oh, we have a quiz. Okay. Present level. Jennifer demonstrates ability to rhyme less than 70% of the time. All right. What's wrong with that one? Less than. Awesome. Yep. It's not a specific um, data point, right? It's less than. So. Um, Jennifer demonstrates the ability to rhyme simple one-syllable patterns with 42% accuracy. There we go. All right, we got another one. All right, present level, Mary can decode CBC words with 55 to 70% accuracy. And then the goal is by November 2nd, given specially designed instruction, Mary will improve her reading comprehension using third grade text from a standard score of 72 to 80 as measured by data collection, Woodcock Johnson and work samples. Oh my goodness, so much going on here. Ranges. All right, what about the goal? Data collection, Woodcock Johnson. Something else in there. Nope, you don't need to. Oh, yeah, you do need citation in that one. Huh. Yeah, you're missing one thing in its alignment. Um, the goal doesn't align with the present level, right? They're two different skills. Um, they don't match in the least. <laughs> so Carrie got it. So Mary can decode CVC words with 62% accuracy. We want her to decode with 80% accuracy. And we have the citation there. Nice job. Oh, five minute break. Um, all right, go do your thing and we will see you in five minutes.
I'm on mute. Is it five minutes, Carly? I didn't look at the time. It's a, we have one more minute. One thirty okay. <laughs> will be five. Okay. <laughs> I know it would help if our little timer thing actually worked. It but never works. I don't know why. I'll have to practice with it, maybe. Okay, it's one thirty-eight. I think you're all ready to get going. All right, let's jump right into functional goals because that's fun. Um, all right, we are going to talk a lot about outcomes. Outcomes are age-appropriate expectations that we want all students to meet. So it's easier to think about this from an academic standpoint. Um, we don't often see outcomes in academic goals, but it's just easier to think so um reading on grade level right we it's an age appropriate expectation you have a seventh grader who's reading on a third grade level you wouldn't write a goal that says student will read at a seventh grade level right you just wouldn't do that um you would write goals around the skills right maybe it's fluency right you're going to write a fluency goal and that is going to bring you closer to that outcome of reading on grade level. So your goals are around those specific skill deficits that are gonna bring that student closer to that outcome of those age appropriate expectations. Um, so this is an example of Eli, he, um, first grade SLD, um, he has a gap in fluent letter ID, and this impacts his ability to participate in literacy activities with same age peers. Um, so we're writing the goal around letter ID, not reading at grade level. Um, we want, can you flip it, Carly? Thank you. Uh, we want Eli to read at a first grade level what skill is um, getting in his way? What skill is he missing that he is unable to read at the first grade level? Letter ID, right? So that's what we're going to teach him. So there are many skills that go into reading on grade level. So that's what we're, our goals are around those skills, not the outcome. Um, Work with your team to figure this out, right? Really talk it out. Um, what helped me, and, and I think all of us on this team when we were teaching, I know every single one of my functional goals were outcomes. Um, maybe not every single one, but most of them were. Um, so really talk it out with the team. Um, what helped me is what are you teaching, right? If you think about what are you teaching, that's the skill, right? You're teaching reading fluency. That's the skill. You're not teaching read at grade level. So think of it that way. So oh, some outcomes that we see a lot, attendance, work completion, behavior. That was mine. Every single one of my students had decreased instances of aggression, decreased instances of eloping, that kind of a thing. But that's not a skill. Safety, attention to task, these are all those age appropriate expectations, not skills. So we have a bunch of examples. So here's Jane. Jane is third grade, OHID2 ADD. Um, she has a gap in self initiation. And this impacts her ability to maintain attention and complete assigned tasks. So you could see we're referencing those outcomes in the how statement, which kind of makes sense, right? We're not teaching her to maintain attention or complete task work, but we're teaching her self-initiation skills and that's hopefully we'll have those outcomes. 
of maintaining attention and completing assigned tasks. Um, so we want Jane to complete her work with her, the same as her peers. We're going to teach her self-initiation skills that will hopefully have that outcome and get her on grade level. Nina, Nina is in first grade, autism. She has a, a gap in her ability to request help. This impacts her ability to engage socially with peers in ways that are not aggressive, right? So this is my kid, right? I would have a goal that said, you know, Nina will reduce instances of aggression, but I wasn't teaching her to reduce instances of aggression. I was teaching her to communicate, right? She's going to ask for help by, you know, hitting, biting something. Um, so you're going to teach her to ask for help without being aggressive. So um, in this case, Nina does not independently ask for help. It's 0% of opportunities. And we want her to independently use a help card to request help in 70% of opportunities. And you could see um, in the goal there as measured by data collection, teacher observation and reduced aggressions, right? But that 70% is directly tied to requesting help, right? And she's requesting help in 70% of opportunities. So what we're seeing sometimes is that the skill will be there, but the measurement will be on the outcome. You want the measurement to be on the skill. Um, so we want Nina to decrease the numbers of aggressions. And so we're going to teach her to request help. Lewis, Lewis, fourth grade, ED. Um, he has deficits in his ability to read and follow a schedule, and this impacts his ability to attend school and participate in all daily activities across his day. Um, so attendance, right, that's the outcome. But what are we teaching? We're teaching him to um, follow a first then board, follow a schedule in the hopes that that will increase his attendance and participation throughout the day. So. Again, what are you teaching, right? What are you teaching that is going to get you closer to that outcome? We have some examples of um, possible skill deficits, right? Maybe, oh gosh, I had a student who would only eat off white plates, right? So he would have a tantrum if you put a different color plate in front of him. So... Teach him to request a preferred color, size, shape, something. Request help, request a break. Um, first then, non-preferred to preferred, calming activities. Visuals, visual schedule, visual timer, self-regulation tools, planner, to-do list. These are all um, skills, right, that will bring you to various outcomes. All right, so data, right? Using the requesting help and aggression example, right? You're, you're maintaining that data on requesting help, right? For progress monitoring and to make sure that the student is getting it, right? You're maintaining that data on requesting help up to 70% of opportunities is what the goal is. You're also maintaining data on aggressions, right? Because you want to make sure that the skill that you're teaching is having that outcome that you're hoping it will have. Um, so it doesn't mean you're not taking data on aggressions. It just means that the goal is tied to what you're teaching. Procedural manual, page 26, talks about this. All right, questions on outcomes, because this is a big one and we all still a little bit have trouble wrapping our heads around this whole thing. All right, we're doing a quiz. If you don't have questions, we go right to the quiz. Um, present level, Margaret is demonstrating reading skills at the fourth grade level and we want her to demonstrate reading skills at the fifth grade level. All right. What's wrong with this one?
the broad outcome. Yep. Um, yep. This is an age appropriate expectation, present level too broad, goal is too broad, no specific skill deficits. You could also kind of say it's multiple skills because there is more than one skill involved in reading. All right, nice job. So what would, let's see, we're working on reading fluency. So Margaret demonstrates reading fluency with 37% with a third grade passage, and we want her to get to 80% with a third grade passage. Nice. All right, next one is Jeffrey. Jeffrey demonstrates aggressive behavior 64% of his day, and we want him to reduce aggressive behaviors to 15% of his day. Hmm. What skill? What are you teaching? That's right. What are you teaching? Um, awesome. The other thing is there's no given statement in this goal. Hmm. I think that was just an oversight. <laughs> Good thing we're not writing IVs anymore. Yes, list the replacement behavior. Who said that? Nice. The replacement behavior because that's what you're teaching. That could be the skill. Nice job. All right, here we go. When presented with situations that require Jeffrey to take a break before becoming aggressive, he will exchange the break card with 19% accuracy, and we want him to do that with 50% accuracy. There we go. We're teaching him to request a break. Perfect. Just a note, um, if you are teaching supports like help card, visual schedule, that kind of thing. Um, make sure that it's in section six so that everybody knows to have these things available. And then once the student um, masters that goal, you're gonna keep it in section six, right? Because you're teaching to them so that they can actually use it. So there we go. Um, communication. Um, yes, we get this. We get the question a lot about articulation. We get it. Um, do I have to have a separate goal for each sound that we're working on? And the answer is no. Articulation is the skill, right? Communication, expressive communication, receptive communication are the outcomes. So you don't have to have a separate goal for each sound you're working on for articulation. And these are links to recordings of present level and outcomes. Um, we're doing present level again in a couple of weeks. I made it a lot more fun, added some data stuff. So come join us. That's fun. All right, I think you guys are getting it. Um, just a note that it's easy to kind of watch this and be like, oh, I got it, yeah, that makes sense. And then you go back and you're writing goals and you're like, oh, maybe I don't get it um, because it's hard. Um, so if you're writing a goal and you're not sure if it's outcome, skill, how you should write it, um, send us, you can email any of us with a hypothetical. Don't send us an IEP um, because if we see something that's non-compliant, we have to ask you to fix it. And then we have to ask for evidence of systemic correction. It just becomes a nightmare. So a hypothetical, if I were to write a goal like this, would it be compliant? Um, we get those more and more often, I think. And um, so feel free. We like to do that. We're teachers, you know, it's kind of a fun part of our job. So feel free. And with that, I think it's Carly's turn. That's me. Yep. 
Okay, so we're moving into section six of the IEP, which is that supplementary aid services, modifications, and or sports. And this is the link to that procedural manual that we keep talking about. And section six is on pages 27 and 28 are part of it. Um, so the first thing is when you're filling out section six, make sure that if you put something in the left-hand column, for a supplementary aid service modification or support that you fill in the entire row. So you wanna make sure you're check, doing those check boxes of when they're able to use it, filling in the location, the frequency, and also that duration. So making sure there are no blank boxes here. Um, there are a couple things I wanna bring your attention to. One is you can see the second one down on this example is an ILAP, an Individual Language Acquisition Plan. If you have a student that is a multilingual learner with a disability, this is where you would document that ILAP. And so then people would know that they have that and that they are also accessing those services. Um, another thing is the very last one is around, refers to NWA reading and accommodations on that. And later uh, towards the end of section six, I have some links that can that will bring you to um, the access accessibility guide for the main three-year assessment and the MAP growth assessments um, throughout the school year. And then also some links to more about those multilingual learners with disabilities if you want more information about that. But this is where you would document all of those pieces. Um, section six, a lot of times um, when I refer to this section, I just say this is where you put those accommodations or modifications for the student. And we just like to kind of give a little highlight of an accommodation is it changes how a student learns the material, where a modification changes what a student is expected or yeah, taught or expected to learn. So there's just a little difference between the two. Um, so if you think of a modification, it's changing that material. Um, and so for exa an example of that would be a student that's taking a math test and a, that student is being allowed to use a calculator on that math test. That would be a modification for a student. And then just an example of an accommodation, you're just changing the manner in which that instruction is given. And so in this case, rather than having the student read the book on their own, you're giving them that accommodation to be able to listen to that same material uh, just on tape and listening to it, either on tape or iPad or however they're accessing them. And you would document all of those in section six, whatever they're needing to be successful throughout their school day. Um, this is also where you would document any other services that are happening. Um, and this will ties to section seven a little bit. We'll talk about it again in that section, because if you have a service provider that is no longer providing direct service and they're like oh I want to do a consult but they don't have it aligned to a goal then that is not going to go in section seven we give guidance that that would be in section six under other and you can label it as a collaboration so our example here is that the regular ed teacher and the occupational therapist would have a collaboration because that occupational therapist is no longer working with that student directly, but they're not working on a goal either. So they're just checking in on the student and that would be documented here. Um, and then another example of that is the one above where the ed tech, the BHP, any related service assistants that may be working with the student, they would be listed in this section also as an accommodation. Um, and just again, making sure that all of those fields are considered and complete. So if you put something on the left, it has to be completed all the way across the row. All right, section 6B is the part on the IEP where you're checking off or discussing as an IEP team whether the student will be taking the alternate assessment. So this is a link to the particip participation, there we go, decision flowchart. Um, because this would be the flowchart that you would use to help you decide whether they're going to take the alternate assessment. And in section 6B on the IEP, 
you have to check one of these boxes. It cannot be blank. It is a must fill. So if the child is going to be taking the alternate assessment, you would check yes. You would give an explanation and it says here that they meet the qualifications outlined in that participation decision flowchart. So that's why I have that link there for you so that you can help use that to make your decision and give that um, explanation. And then also they would then need objectives with their academic goals. If the student is not taking the alternate assessment, you just need to make sure that you're checking either no or NA. It doesn't matter to us compliance wise, which one is checked, it just cannot be blank. Um, so the collaboration piece, the question is, could you possibly speak further about the collaboration or tell me where I can read more about that? And we will talk a little bit more about it in section seven. So if I don't give you the information you're looking for, I can definitely point you in a better direction. Um, 6B, the alternate assessment, The uh, this is a link to the alternate academic achievement standards. Because as I said before, if the student is going to be taking the alternate assessment, the academic goals then need objectives. And those goals would be expected to be around the alternate academic achievement standards rather than the traditional common core or main learning results due to their need for that alternate assessment. So this link will bring you to those. And they're also known as the core con content connectors. So you've got the core content connectors in ELA and math, but they're also referred to as the alternate academic achievement standards. So they're kind of one in the same. Um, and this is just an example of how you can write out those objectives if the student is taking the alternate assessment and they need those objectives. You can see here in this example, Lily's goal is around participating in conversations and expressing her own thoughts in eight out of 10 opportunities. And the citation there is linked to those core content connectors or the alternate academic achievement standards. And then those objectives just break down that goal so that she can, it, it's showing her meeting that goal in smaller steps throughout that year of the IEP. And these are those resources that I said I would uh, give you a link to. So the first one just goes over those accommodations and modifications, it gives you a little more information about that and examples. Um, the next one is the main through year assessment overview. That's where you can find that accessibility guide and it talks about the embedded and non-embedded accommodations for the MAP growth assessments as well as the main through year. And then a link to the multilingual learners with disabilities. And we do have a recorded training around that um, guidance document for multilingual learners. And then if you have a student taking that multi-state alternate assessment, then this is a link to find out all the information around that. Okay, so that's section six. I see there was another question up there. It looks like Jennifer has answered that. So it's up to you or your district when you choose no versus NA. That's really a district IEP team decision. It's not something that we look at um, as far as compliance, just one of those needs to be checked off. So section seven, this is the special ed and related services. So just keep in mind that in section seven, whatever is here should really be about what the child needs um, versus the school or program schedule. And we see this a lot more when we look at middle school or high school typically because a lot of times that's when block scheduling happens. We do see it in other places also, but this is just something to keep in mind. Um, so if you have a student that require, that you're saying needs specially designed instruction for reading comprehension for 30 minutes per week, that's what you're putting on the IEP, the service grid of the IEP. 
So then you're looking at your block scheduling or your scheduling, your school schedule, and you're like, oh, the study hall is from nine to 10. Just because that study hall is from nine to 10 and that's when you're going to provide that service, the frequency would not be changed to an hour a week or an hour a day or during that hour. It's really on what the child needs. So the child needs 30 minutes per week. That's what goes in the service grid. Now, one way to help accommodate those block schedules or those funky school schedules is to list as an accommodation in section six that the student could choose to stay in that special ed setting for the remainder of that time. Um, and then you wouldn't be over restricting them to the special ed setting. It would be their choice and they're accessing that accommodation of staying in that setting rather than going back to general. But if you have 30 minutes per week and the student is saying, I wanna go back to the general ed classroom, you can't tell them, no, you can't go back, you have to stay here. It really has to be about their needs. <clears throat> when filling in the service grid, just like section six, anything that you identify as a service on the service grid needs to be filled entirely across the row. So make sure you're filling in the position responsible and that should be the certified special educator or licensed related service provider. Remember those assistants or ed techs, BHPs go on the um, section six as an accommodation. Um, Fill in the location, either as special ed, general ed, or both. Fill in that frequency. Um, this can be minutes, hours, weekly, daily, monthly. It doesn't matter how you document that as long as it's understandable to everyone at the IEP team meeting, including the parents. So just making sure that's good for everybody. And then the duration. Fill in that duration of the service whether it's adjusted because it's going to be stopping sooner or starting later than the IEP, and especially paying attention to the ESY dates, those extended school year dates. If you put it for the entire duration of the IEP, that could mean that the parents could come back and ask for ESY during February vacation or April vacation or winter break, unless you specify those ESY summer dates only. Um, and then just a little side note, speech and language services are listed on the top half under special ed services and on the bottom half under related services. And the only time they would be identified on the top part is if they are identified as a child with a speech and language impairment, either by itself or as a multiple, or if the child's been identified with autism and speech and language is their only service. Otherwise, speech and language services is listed on the bottom section as a related service. Now, when you're filling out the service grid, um, just remember that you're, you want to indicate the specialized instruction that the student needs. So for children ages 55 to 20, each identified instructional area should be listed unless the child is accessing a self-contained program. And the procedural manual explicitly talks about this on page 32, and these are some examples. Um, and I'm, this is an example of a service grid right here. So you can see that this student has specially designed instruction for both ELA and behavior. So you can put that together, but it explicitly states what those services are for. And then the row is completed. And then those extended school year services are there and those dates have been adjusted. And then you have that occupational therapy consult that's been identified as a consult. So then we would make sure that there was a goal that identified that consult with the occupational therapist. Because every service needs a goal and every goal needs a service. This is that alignment piece. So you're, we look both ways for this. So here's an example of Elaine, and Elaine's goal says given specially designed instruction and consult from an occupational therapist. So you can see it explicitly states in that given statement, the two services, and we would go to the service grid and look for those two services to make sure that they're there. Then we would do the same looking at the services. We see these listed and we would go back to the goal 
and be like, all right, did they list in a goal that she was getting these services? So the self-regulation skills under specially designed instruction are aligned to that given specially designed instruction and the goal. And that consult from an occupational therapist is aligned to that occupational therapy consultation on the service grid. So it, they align to each other. And you can do this. You can put two services within one goal if you're working on that same goal. Now, to go back to that collaboration versus consultation, the consultation is really around the skill still being worked on with that service provider. So you could take any service provider. We're just using occupational therapy in this example, but you could fill it in with anything else. But when you are putting it in section seven, it needs to be aligned to a goal. And so it should explicitly state in the given statement, given consultation, given OT consultation, given speech and language consultation, whatever it is, and then that specific skill that you are continuing to work on just in a more or a less restrictive setting. Because the idea of consultation is that you are going from that direct instruction and now you're going into the general ed setting, that less restrictive setting, and making sure that that skill can be carried over. And so it's still aligned to a goal. If you're like, I'm not going to be working on a skill with the student, I just want to check in with the student, make sure they're doing okay, and you're just doing a little discussion every now and then, then that would be more appropriate in section six as an accommodation, as collaboration, because it is not attached to a goal. So you do not need to have a goal if it's in section six, but in section seven you do, and it needs to still be that skill specific goal, not a maintenance goal or anything like that. Okay, so also in section seven, you are not going to be listing content areas like social studies, science, health, et cetera because you don't write goals around those. If you go way back to the beginning where Ashley went over those uh, broad areas of academic, it was reading, writing, math, speaking, listening, because science and social studies, those are not skill deficit areas. It would be one of those other skill deficit areas that are keeping them from being able to participate and access the general ed curriculum in those content areas. So instead, the specially designed instruction would be around that reading comprehension or possibly that executive functioning or those self-regulation skills or the written expression, things like that. So those would be on the service grid. There would be nothing listed there around those content areas. Okay, so it's time for a quiz over section six and seven. So let's take a look. This is section seven. And so we've got the service grid and you can see here, we've got some specially designed instruction for reading comprehension and science. And you can see the rest of the information is filled out. What is wrong with this? Why is this not compliant? Right, science isn't a special ed service. Science should not be on the service grid. And, excuse me, the IEP duration is incorrect. Excellent. So, no SDI in science. They don't have a disability in science. They're getting it through reading comprehension. Um, and that IEP duration, it should be that 364-day timeline. So, it, you have to back it off one day. So, instead, you would be addressing reading comprehension for your specially designed instruction, and you can see the dates are fixed. Okay, how about one more? Take a look at this service grid. What do you see is non-compliant here? We've got some reading fluency, we have some ESY services, some speech and language services. Right, we have blank boxes. We do not like blank boxes. And there's an ed tech, position responsible, good catch. 
Anything else? This always gets me too. It's ESY dates. Yes, someone caught it before I flipped the slide. So need to fill in all those boxes across the row, right? So location is missing. Um, the ed tech cannot be the person on the service grid. That needs to be the special ed teacher and make sure those ESY dates are changed to ESY. So here you go. This is correctly filled in. That location is there. The ESY dates have been adjusted and special ed teacher is the person responsible. All right, any questions about section six or seven? I think Jennifer was answering some chat box. So thank you for that. <clears throat> All right, since she took care of that, I will move on. Section eight, the least restrictive environment. <laughs> Jennifer should be doing this one because this is her favorite. <laughs> uh, okay, so least restrictive environment this is what we look for compliance wise when we are looking at IEPs. Um, and you can see the bold and underlined words in this um, quote from Muser and IDEA. It's really about the removal of students with disabilities from the regular ed environment shall only occur when the nature or severity of the disability is such that they can't be in regular classes with their peers, basically. So it's really about the nature or severity of the disability. But unfortunately, on the IEP, that is not what the prompt says. That's why Jennifer hates us so much. <laughs> um, so here's just a little visual about least restrictive environment. The least restrictive is that general ed setting. We're always trying to get our students back to that general ed setting and having them participate with their same age peers. Um, and then it goes all the way up to that most restrictive hospital homebound. And here's just another visual to give you that idea. Same information though. And we are always trying to get them, get students back to that general ed setting. Here is the prompt on the IEP. It asks for an explanation of the extent, if any, to which the child will not participate with non-disabled children in the regular class and in extracurricular other academic, non-academic activities. So it sounds like they want you to write what they're getting for services and when they're not with their peers or like why they're not with their peers. So it's very misleading. Um, and then also just remember that percentage, that's that time in the regular classroom. So you need to make sure you have both of those pieces completed. And when you're thinking about that time within the regular classroom, the least restrictive environment is really about the student's access to that general ed instruction. So you're really thinking about when the student is in the general ed setting, are they receiving the same access to that general ed curriculum as their peers? Because even if they're in the classroom and they're working on completely different skills or a different subset of skills, that really isn't part of that least restrictive environment. Um, but if they're within the general ed setting and they are working on similar content as a general ed content that's being um, taught at that time or like a subset of skills that everyone else is working on, then that really is part of that least restrictive environment. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about that percentage of time in the regular classroom. And then for your least restrictive environment statement, this is really what we are thinking about when we're thinking about the students, um, the nature or severity of the student's disability. So just thinking about Susie, Susie's learning disability in reading and math are to such a degree that she requires time in a more restrictive setting to receive specialized instruction to address her academic deficits. There's no need to restate any of the services that she's getting, like from the service grid or times or anything like that. You're really just focusing on how that nature or severity of the disability is impacting them and the, why they can't be with their peers. And then thinking about Benny, Benny's a student with autism. And so they're saying that Benny's autism is to such a degree that he requires time in a more restrictive setting to receive specialized instruction to address his language deficits. So again, just thinking about that 
nature and severity of disability and why they cannot be with their peers. Okay, and here is a link to our recorded training around section six, seven, and eight. Um, it gives a little more detailed information, more specific to those sections, shorter. It's about um, 40 minutes. So if you have more questions around that. Also, we have an updated least restrictive environment office hours happening in March, and that's the link to that. All right, any questions? I haven't seen anything pop up in the chat box, but if anything, feel free to ask away. Right. Other considerations. So as you write IEPs and work to complete your paperwork, just some other things to think about. Um, we've kind of shortened this section quite a bit. So here we have the procedural manual. We have referenced this several times because it is an invaluable resource. Um, has all of these special education forms that you're using day in and day out, and it gives directions, instructions, and examples. It really breaks things down. And we pull a lot of that information out of the procedural manual and put it into our trainings. Um, each of these on the side, the written notice, the eligibility forms, um, we have recorded trainings on those and these are linked right to them. So you click them, you'll it'll take you to the written notice recording. Eligibility forms, we have a training that goes over all of those forms, the adverse effect form, the SLD form, the specific learning disability form, the speech and language form. We have another training on the summary of performance. So that link is there also. Um, when you're thinking about transition plans, those of you that work with high school students and you are writing transition plans, we have a training specific to that, and it also goes over um, the transition plan part of the IEP under the IEP on page 14. Uh, and then B11 Child Find is about referral um, and that process. And so in the procedural manual, you have the referral for special ed services if you're ever helping someone with that referral process. You have that parental consent for evaluation is available there. Um, and it goes through all of, like I said, those direct, directions, instructions, anything you need to know about any of these topics. And each of these, like I said, is linked to a recording that will go over these as well. Another one that is not listed in the procedural manual is abbreviated day. An abbreviated day is a day where a special ed student goes to school for less time than their peers. So if abbreviated day applies to any of your students, click this link and go to the abbreviated day training to figure out or to learn how to best document that. Because abbreviated day is all about documentation. There are certain steps that need to be followed in timelines that need to be followed. And in that abbreviated day training, those are outlined for you. Okay, any questions around those other extra pieces or anything else? Okay. Very quiet on this second half. All right, so just to kind of uh, go back and follow up, at the beginning we asked you to share something that you wanted clarification on or you had questions about, and just to kind of help us gauge how we're doing with our presentations and you know, if you're getting things out of what we're giving, um, let us know what was something that you did get clarification around or a question that was answered from today's training. We would love to know. Oh, good. It looks like P. 
people did get clarification around section four and the goals and the present level statements. Excellent. And as I, I know Jennifer said it, I think Colette said it at the beginning, maybe Ashley said it, you can always reach out to us in between also. Send us those hypotheticals. We will send feedback. Yeah, clarification on the functional gaps and present levels, yep. Learned more about how to write those goals, excellent. Mm -hmm. Related services, yeah, that I'm glad someone brought that up because we have some trainings that we are inviting that kind of like really would love related service providers to join us for. So I'm gonna start clicking through to our resources here. That procedural manual again, great resource. The main unified special ed regulations or MUSER, also a great resource, not as user-friendly as the procedural main. So here is that link to that IEP quick reference document. Again, we shared it at the beginning, but here it is again, just in case. And here is our professional development schedule. So we, most of these have happened already. We have an office hours tomorrow around the advanced written notice and written notice. Um, and then this is the professional development schedule all the way through May. So you can see there are more topics to come. And all of the ones that we have already done are recorded and on our website. These are the ones that we would love to have you share with others. So we have a couple that are geared more toward general ed teachers. So we did one in October around discipline and manifestation determination. That's the link to the recording. Feel free to share that. Then we have one coming up that will be special ed law for general ed teachers. We have had many requests for this. So hopefully we get a good turnout. Um, and then we have those related service provider ones that we feel like are, are more geared toward those related service providers. We're going to be really diving into the writing measurable functional goals and avoiding outcomes. And then also talking about that consultation related service goals that whole thing. So I know someone asked about the collaboration versus consultation. And I think this will be, you know, have more information at this training also. And then this is our feedback and contact our form. Like I said, we're always looking for ways to improve our professional development. We really appreciate feedback from all of you in the field. Um, and so we do our best to adjust it when we can, and I am trying to multitask, so here we go, there. So there is the link to that feedback and contact hour form. Give us feedback, select the training. Today is a full IEP training. Enter your email address if you would like a contact hour certificate for today, and that will get out to you. Just make sure you enter your email correctly, so no, no typos in there, so it gets to you. Um, and then finally, this is like our resources, uh, our professional development calendar, which has all of those PD that's upcoming, those recordings and PowerPoints that you've seen throughout the training. This will take you to the page that has all of them and then other special ed resources. And one more time, our contact information, because we are here to support you. And please reach out if you have questions with hypotheticals. We love to give feedback and just help in any way that we can. And thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs>